back into the Labour Party situation then, because, of course, we've got a, a general election coming up in probably about a year or so's time, give or take. A uh, conversation then is turning to who should stand uh, and represent the parties, in particular in the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, remember him? Uh, well, he represents, and he has done for the best part of about 40 years, actually, Islington North. He's lost his whip um, after saying that uh, allegations of anti-Semitism were exaggerated. Paul Embry, I'll come to you first on this one. You are a Labour member, is that right? Correct. Uh, do you think that he should be able to stand as a Labour candidate in the next general election? Yeah, I think he should. I don't think a strong enough case has been made for him not to stand, frankly. I mean, look, Jeremy Corbyn is a Marmite figure, both inside the Labour movement and beyond. Um, you have to recognise he led the party to its worst defeat since the, the 1930s. But equally, is a long-serving and very dedicated member of the Labour Party and the Labour movement. Um, extremely popular, for right or wrong, in his constituency. I mean, he's, he's won every election. He's stood in Islington North by a comfortable margin. And I think the problem for the Labour Party, really, is if, if they don't allow him, if they don't restore the whip, don't allow him to stand as a candidate, then I think there's a very good chance he'll stand as an independent. And I think he'll win as an independent. Um, I think you? he'll defeat the Labour candidate in Islington North, whoever that would be. See, I'm not so sure, because albeit he's got a very strong track record, he's very loud, he's very prominent in his constituency. Uh, Benedict, um, Paul's saying that he thinks he would win if he stood as an indie, but I think what would happen mm. is that Keir Starmer and the Labour activists would kind of rally around and go, look, this is our chance, our opportunity to get the Tories out. Don't, you know, like, don't choose person mm. over party, because that could be the deciding vote against a majority? Potentially. I do think he should stand as an independent and give it a go if he really does back himself that he himself is the reason why he keeps getting elected as Labour leader and not just the colour of his... Uh, sorry, as, as the Labour candidate, candidate yeah. and not just the colour of his rosette, then he should back himself in that situation and possibly shouldn't be petitioning to be let, let back into the Labour Party to do it because obviously his point is that he was wrongly got rid of and that there was a campaign against him and he needs to be able to show that actually he can stand on his own two feet and that he's not riding on the coattails. I've I, I worked for 20 years in Islington. Um, I know the area really well. Doing what? As a firefighter at, oh, Islington, right. at Islington Fire Station. And Jeremy Corbyn used to come and stand on our picket line, incidentally. Um, and whenever you were in his company, you could see how popular he was. I mean, he, he got the sort of reception among his constituents that I guess a lot of MPs are not used to. I think a lot of MPs would probably get quite a bit of criticism if they walked around their constituency. But he was treated um, as a bit of a hero in Islington North. Uh, he's got that real connection with people. Whatever you think of him, he's got that connection with people. And I suspect what it might be... I mean, you say you don't think he, he would win, but, I mean, I think back to the, the London mayor election when the Labour Party did a similar thing with Ken Livingstone um, and they stopped him through various manoeuvres from being the Labour candidate for, for mayor in 2000. And they put Frank Dobson in as a Labour candidate. Instead, Livingston stood as an independent and swept the board because people felt that this was a complete stitch-up. Um, and I suspect very strongly in Islington North it would be a similar scenario. Um, you see, when you talk about Corbyn, like if I was to talk about one, Corbyn to one of my brothers, my, mm. my youngest brother actually, who loves Jeremy Corbyn, uh, he would say to me, the thing with Jeremy Corbyn is, uh, Michelle, he's amazing, but you don't realise it because the media ran a very successful smear campaign against him. Uh, yeah, no, I get that. I, I do hear that a lot, that he's Jesus and that everybody's just against him. And actually, all the evidence doesn't suggest that he's a particularly intelligent politician. He's just somebody who has a certain set of principles that are actually great with a core um, demographic in the Labour Party itself. Actually, you know, he might be very popular in his constituency, but certain constituencies do tend towards slightly different politics. I mean, uh, uh, there are several constituencies in London, several on Merseyside, that tend to return slightly more out-there candidates than other places do. But actually, I think Keir Starmer's got to look at this slightly more broadly. He really is a Marmite figure, as you say, Jeremy Corbyn. He's also a threat to Keir Starmer's authority. If he's able to sort of say things that are potentially anti-Semitic or not and get away with it, then that is a challenge to his authority. Keir Starmer also has to be able to turn around to the country and say, I'm not bringing you a government of cranks. I'm not bringing you people who are going to start mouthing off about Israel when what people want to know about is, can they turn their electricity on? He needs to be able to do that. And I think if you have people like Jeremy Corbyn back at the forefront of the whole thing, 
then there are going to be seats that the Labour Party lost at the last general election that a lot of people who might otherwise vote Labour might go, it's the same group of people. It's the same group of people I didn't vote for last time because I thought they couldn't be trusted, and they're still here. And, you know, it doesn't matter that Keir Starmer says things have changed, Corbyn's still there, XYZ, they're still there, they're still spouting off, and I don't trust them enough, not necessarily to vote Tory, but to give them my vote this time around. And I think that would be the fear, that enough slightly cranky candidates might come forward for Labour to turn enough voters off them. I, could, I can hear my brother, um, well, I can't actually, because he's travelling at the moment, but I could hear him if he was watching tonight. He'd be shouting at the screen and he would be saying, see, this is what people uh, in the media do. They call Jeremy Corbyn uh, a crank or they allude to him to be in some kind of crank. He would argue, people <laughs> like my brother would argue, that the establishment, if I can use that word, uh, Paul, were threatened by Corbyn because he stood to overturn the status quo. He really was wanted radical change, whether it was nationalisation, whatever it was, he was really going to, if he got in and followed his promises, he was going to get a hold of this country and change it, whether for good or bad, we can debate, but he would have changed it. And a lot of people were uh, fearful of that. I think that's partly true. I mean, there's no question that if you get a radical candidate from the left in this country um, who looks like they might take power, then I think elements of the establishment and the media will inevitably try to do that person down to make sure um, that that doesn't happen, that they don't win power. But equally, the idea that the only reason that the Labour Party lost so heavily in 2019 was because the media were anti-Corbyn, I think is just fanciful. The, the, the Labour Party have been losing the working class vote in this country since 2000 under Tony Blair. The trajectory was only going in one way. And the truth is, however popular Corbyn was in certain quarters amongst the, the demographic, the young, the city-based... Yeah, like my brother's sort of, kind of... Yeah, and, and to a certain degree the urban middle class and whatever... The key question, I think, for any Labour Party leader, could I go into a pub in Stoke-on-Trent and feel at home? Would people warm to me? Would people see me as one of them? Now, I think... I don't think Corbyn could do that. I think Starmer could. No, I don't think Starmer could. He, can he do got chucked out. I don't think could. Starmer pretends that he can, though. That's no, the thing. I, I don't think I don't he's think pretending he to be a man of the people. He's there to fix. He's there to steady the ship. And I actually think, in many ways, he wasn't expecting to be doing anywhere near this well when he was given the brief that fell into his lap. He was expecting it to be a sort of a clawing back job. Now he's looking potentially at a majority, and he's thinking. Well, let's not ruin this now, chaps. Let's not, you know, fumble it right at the death. But to Paul's point, mm. if he needs those uh, people in the men, whatever, in the pubs of yeah. Cirque on Trent and all the rest of it, doesn't he? He has to appeal to those people. Yeah, but do you know who he doesn't have to appeal to? Who? The people on the far right. Uh, the far left, sorry, because they will probably end up going for a Labour candidate anyway. There aren't really alternatives for them. It's not like the Tories where you have every now and then you have UKIP or the Brexit Party or Reform and there are insurgencies. You'll get a few people who will go for the Lib Dems, mm. but probably not that many, and they'll probably do that tactically in seats where Labour are less likely to win. The average person who is hard left will probably end up voting Labour in seats where it matters. Starmer doesn't need to worry about those people's votes.